Young Adult author Mary Gray of MaryGrayBooks.com and Monster Ivy Publishing. Today I'm going to dive into part two of my five-part series, How to Write Faith-Based Messages and Secular Stories. For those who might remember in this section, I'll discuss how to fill your spiritual well and know what to add without getting preachy. Some of the earliest philosophers, such as Aristotle and Socrates, believed that thought precedes action. In Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics, for instance, Aristotle asserts that a person's positive or negative actions are typically preceded by an idea. I wouldn't jab my kid in the eye without thinking about it first. So it makes sense that if we increase the number of our positive thoughts, we'll be better citizens and friends, better parents, children, and siblings. We'd be thinking about serving one another or offering compliments instead of screaming in a fit of road rage. Filling one's spiritual well, though, isn't always a high priority. We have so many tangible issues to contend with. How to supply our food, keep a roof over our heads, get to work, take care of our kids. Many of us, as well-meaning as we are, feel we simply don't have the time. The Apostle Paul said to put on the whole armor of God. We wouldn't go into battle without armor or protection, would we? So how do we protect our inner selves and our spirits? We read our scriptures and pray. Luckily for us, we live in a time when accessing God's word is easier now more than ever. I have an app on my phone called Gospel Li Library that has both the text and audio of scriptures, years of talks, and lesson manuals. I can read when I first wake up. I can listen after I drive my kids to school. I can stick in my earbuds and listen to God's word while vacuuming my house. According to a study conducted by the American Bible Society in February of 2017, 58% of Americans wish they spent more time reading or listening to the Bible. That's more than half of us in the United States. We want to fill our spiritual wells, so how can we make it happen if uh, not first thing in the morning, then in another part of our day? I would suggest one key strategy for increasing our number of positive thoughts to improve the way we treat our children to lessen our road rage. We should set aside a regular time when we can read God's word without any distractions, or in the very least, multitask. Something is better than nothing. To be honest, I haven't always had this goal. I was great as a teenager. I took part in my church's early morning seminary. I either studied on my own or I went to a class every morning at like 6 a.m. But somewhere along college and having little kids, I let my priorities slip. And then after making a 2,000 mile cross country trip with my three children aged eight, five, and two, I realized I either needed to take care of more of my spiritual health or I would die. And I'm not joking. My two-year-old was sick on that trip. My kids wouldn't stop fighting. And I kept thinking, I want to cease to exist, make it stop. I can't keep going on this way. I often didn't like my children and I often didn't like myself, honestly. And that's when I decided that I needed to make a change. I needed to go to the gym and I needed to read my scriptures every single day. It's been four years since I started taking care of my physical and spiritual health and it is the best choice I ever made. So then assuming we agree that it's imperative to fill our spiritual wells, how can we know what to add in our manuscripts? And then how can we do it without coming across as preachy? Four years ago, when I decided to make scripture reading a non-negotiable part of my day, I noticed something wonderful started happening. I'd read about God reshaping the world in the second coming, and I suddenly knew how to write about natural disasters and what concrete setting elements I should include, like rivers and valleys. When I read about Christ's Sermon on the Mount, I thought about all the stories about revenge out there, and I knew I had to write a story about turning the other cheek. That's the beautiful part. When you read God's word before you sit down to write, your mind automatically fills in the blanks. Reading scriptures is ideal for discovering character arcs and themes. Adam and Eve learned about obedience. Daniel in the lion's den learned to be brave. Peter learned the English from denying Christ and then showed us what repentance looks like. To write faith-based messages in our secular stories, we need to read our scriptures and pray every single day. Which leads me to the final part of this section, how to avoid coming across as preachy. I'm going to share two secrets with you that you probably won't find all that shocking. The first, every story already has a message. In Friends, for instance, Rachel learned that work isn't the most important thing in her life, but relationships, her friends, her family. In Anne of Green Gables, Anne learned to curb, curb her tongue and apologize. I'm sure the writers of those stories didn't go into them wanting to introduce Christian themes, but isn't the second great commandment to love your neighbor like Rachel learned? And didn't Jesus teach us to turn the other cheek like 
and learned. We don't have to explicitly say that a message comes from the New Testament or have a character discover their epiphany from speaking with a rabbi. Can we show it that way? Of course. Can we camouflage it? Both tactics are great. Now my second secret. Some people will be angry no matter what you write. I'm going to tell you a little bit about my first novel. When I wrote it and released it, it made many people angry. It's about a, a girl who escapes psychological abuse in a dystopian-like society. And when many bloggers read the book, they wanted a Buffy the Vampire Slayer. They wanted a girl who was strong and snarky. But that wasn't the book I'd chosen to write. It was about escaping an unhealthy relationship. And I have since gotten the rights back from the book and look forward to re-releasing it. But I'm going to release it with the tagline, A Novel About Psychological Abuse. That should clear up things. Of course, when I read reviews of any of my favorite books, I find tons of negative reviews. The truth is, we all like different things. So I remind myself of this when I think about re-releasing The Dollhouse Asylum. I have a healthy message that some people will enjoy and need. I want to thank you so much for watching the second segment of How to Write Faith-Based Messages in Secular Stories. This segment was on filling your spiritual well and knowing what to add without getting preachy. Next week, I'll discuss how to know where to add these precious gems of knowledge we gain from scripture reading via the sneaky art of subplotting. Thank you so much for watching. See you next week.